Hi, welcome to Kelsey Ed, and today we're going to be looking at the IGCSE Computer Science Paper 1 examination. We're going to be going over some past exam paper questions and giving you the set answers as well as some of the common mistakes that people might make and information on how to approach these questions and the key vocabulary you should be looking to use. Please do try to attempt each question yourself and pause the video, try to answer it and then compare that against the answers that I have given. I have deliberately repeated some of the topics down the line so that you can see how you are improving and if you manage to improve your answer based on the first explanation. So go ahead, enjoy and good luck for all of your examinations. If you like this content, of course, like and subscribe so you can know when the next video is coming out. So we have a few tips first of all and common errors if you are taking this exam paper. The number one is to always answer in full sentences. Sometimes people just want to put a one word answer or you may have looked at a mark scheme and you think that the way to get the mark is just to put that one word answer. But mark schemes are designed for teachers. For you, it should be in a full sentence and you need to make sure that you read that question carefully so when you answer using that full sentence, you are in fact relating that back to the scenario. So read the question, figure out the scenario and give an answer that relates to that. A lot of technologies and the processes that are mentioned can be used in different ways and the examiner wants to know that you understand those different ways, not just the principles of operation, but where it's used in real life and why it might vary in different scenarios. You want to be careful not not to duplicate ideas and we'll touch on that in a couple of the questions that we look at today. You need to make sure that each answer is unique. So the last one is to pace yourself. So this is a top tip that I give to all of my students and I actually tell them first of all read the whole paper through. Before you start getting going you've got enough time it's an hour and 45 minutes just sit there for five minutes and read through the whole entire paper first and get an idea of what questions are coming and what kind of pacing you need. And then also just go and answer all of the those ones that you feel really confident in. Like don't rush them but go and get those ones done first and then tackle some of the harder ones later when you're already feeling pretty confident about what you have done and you've got enough time to sit there and know that you can think it over without feeling the pressure that oh this question is taking me forever and yeah you just get too nervous and don't worry about that like take your time you don't have to go from question one to the end you can do it any order you want it's your world. Okay so with that let's get into a couple of questions. So Here's the first one. The memory of a computer contains data and instructions in binary. The following instruction is stored in memory. Convert the instruction into hexadecimal. So hexadecimal is one of the easiest to convert. Hexadecimal to binary is so easy. And just look at how I'm breaking this up right here. So if you actually just break each nibble up. So a nibble is four bits. Break these up into nibbles and each one of these will represent the hexadecimal value for that position. So what do I mean by that? Well, two, four, one, two, four, eight are our first four binary positions and you will just convert those. So let's start over here and I put a table here to help you if you are not familiar with the binary positions, but you will need to learn these for the exam. This one is but a true bit. So if it's a zero, we don't count it. If it's a one, we count it. So the only true bit here is the number two. And so in hexadecimal, this would be the number two. So we'll count up our next one. So here we have eight and we have one. Eight plus one is nine. In our next one, we have 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, which makes 15. And in the last one, 8 plus 4 makes 12. So then we just write down what is the hexadecimal equivalent of that. So 2 is 2, 9 is 9, 15 is F, and 12 is C. And so the answer to this question is 29FC. Next question follows on from this hexadecimal question and it says why might a programmer prefer to read the instruction in hexadecimal rather than in binary? Well let's just look right back at that. Which one of these was easier for you to see? 29FC or this string of ones and zeros, okay? Also just look at how long this string is compared to 
these four characters. So let's think about those things. So you could actually represent a larger number of values using fewer characters. This topic is called data representation. So be careful to make sure that you're not saying that it is a smaller storage size. Um, it's not. You're just representing the same number of values using fewer characters. Um, and this will then also take up less space on screen. So it's not a smaller size, but it will take up less space on screen because you can represent more characters. So the shorter length of these characters also makes that much easier to understand as we looked from the last one with our 29FC. I can still tell it you off the top of my head. I can't remember that 0010. I cannot. Also, it's easy to recognize character codes for debugging. There will be set codes. It might be a little three um, character code like CF9. Um, that's a lot easier to recognize than 12 bits. So where are some of these uses of hexadecimal? Why might we use this in computer science? Well, um, a really easy one, which most of you probably know, is the HTML co codes, and they represent the RGB spectrum in web development. What we want to do when we're giving these answers here, notice that all of my answers have been in full sentences. Um, so not only do I say that this is HTML, I also say that it is used in web development. Same thing here. This could be a representation of a Mac or an IP address. That allows a larger combination of unique address addresses. So I'm not just saying it's a MAC address, I'm explaining why. And it could also be for error messages. Um, so for example, if you have um, like a washing machine, uh, you might get these errors on a microwave. Any sort of embedded system um, will likely have a smaller display screen and therefore a hexadecimal code would be the best way to represent an error. And then you could look that up in the handbook. All right, so now let's take a look at memory sizes. So here we are going to calculate which one is either larger or smaller. We've got some true false statements. So all we need to do is check the boxes. I've put a little guide for you here if you're not familiar. Um, now what we're going to do is we're just going to use approximate bytes. Okay, so we're just going to do it to the thousands because it's really easy for us to work it out quickly and get an idea of the sizing. It's not asking us to give a specific to the thousand and twenty-four. We're not working in the power of two here. 47 kilobytes is larger than 10 megabytes. True or false? Well, let's work this out. So one megabyte is equal to 1000 kilobytes. So you should pretty much already be able to figure out the answer to this one, but let's break it down even further. So 10 megabytes would be 10,000 kilobytes. Is 10,000 kilobytes bigger than 47 kilobytes? I'm pretty sure it is. So this one would be false. 47 kilobytes is not bigger than 10 megabytes. So next, we're back to our same one megabyte byte equals a thousand kilobytes and so in this one I'm just going to take the 0 0.5 megabytes because half of a megabyte would essentially be 500 kilobytes. Now going to bytes, one kilobyte equals 1000 bytes so 500 kilobytes would be 500,000 bytes. So a couple of simple calculations of just adding on your zeros here is going to show you really quickly that this is way larger than 250 bytes. So is 250 bytes smaller than 0 0.5 megabytes? Well, yes, absolutely, that is true. So next, 50 gigabytes is larger than 100 megabytes. So one gigabyte is equal to 1,000 megabytes. So 50 gigabytes would therefore be 50,000 megabytes. So is 50,000 megabytes greater than 100 megabytes? So we can confirm that this one is true. Okay, last one here. One terabyte is smaller than four gigabyte. I think we should be able to quite quickly just know the answer to this one, but we'll go through it. So one terabyte is equal to 1,000 gigabytes. Okay, so immediately one terabyte, we know that's 1,000 gigabytes. So we can already see here that four gigabytes is definitely smaller than 1,000 gigabytes. So is one terabyte smaller than four gigabyte? Absolutely not. This one is false. So a couple of quick calculations here and you can easily pick up four marks.
Okay, so computer architecture. Signals are sent to and from the components of a processor using buses. So immediately we know that we're looking at the fetch execute cycle here because it's mentioning inside the processor and the buses that connect the components. And we're going to identify and describe the purpose of two different buses. There are three different buses. They are the address bus, the data bus, and the control bus. You're going to get one mark for putting a bus in each one of these. So any of the three, you can pick two of them, whichever you feel the most confident with. This is a six mark question, so you get one mark for each bus, and then you need to get two marks for describing what the purpose of those buses are. So here's a little list I've put together, so it's easier for me to show you the purpose for each one individually here. So, transports the address location of the next instruction to be fetched. Transports the data for the instruction currently in use or being processed. Transports the control signals for all CPU actions. So these are three descriptions here. And I think you should be able to match up which one goes with which bus. And the really important things I want you to pay attention to here is that I've mentioned it's the next instruction to be fetched. It's the instruction currently being used. This is really important. You can't just say it holds the memory address. This is um, no good because there are multiple memory addresses. There are multiple items of data. We really need to let the examiner know, actually, I understand. It's holding the address of the next instruction that will be fetched and it will also be accessing what is processed next. If you're not familiar with the fetch execute cycle, then I'll put a link to my video right up here at this card now. The last bus is the control bus. It's like the conductor. It's in charge of all of the signals. Any actions that need to be occur, need to occur, these will be transported on this bus. Notice also that I keep repeatedly using the word transport. So actually these can get you two marks just just if they are written out fully and correctly, referencing um, that it's transporting the, the address and that it's the current address. So, but the, you can also get more by giving the direction. So there are two directions. It's either unidirectional or bidirectional. Unidirectional is one way, bidirectional is both ways. The address that is a one-way bus, that's a unidirectional, because all it needs to do is point to the address in memory and say, oh, it's this one, look, there's a piece of data here. The other two are both bidirectional. Um, arguably, the control bus can be unidirectional or bidirectional, um, but if you put bidirectional on that, you'd be absolutely fine. So if it's easier to remember, both are bidirectional. And the data, that makes sense because data can be read and writes, written. So a data bus can go in both ways. Am I taking data or fetching data? Both. All right, so memory and storage. So these can be really easy questions if you take your time to answer them and don't rush popping in answers and just sort of cross the answers off as you come across them. So first of all it mentions that a computer has two different types of memory. So what we want to be thinking about here is primary and secondary memory. There are three types. We have primary, secondary, and offline. But offline is not a component within the computer, so it's not a requirement of every system. But if we want to run a computer system, we need to have primary and secondary memory. The primary memory directly accessed by this computer, uh, by the CPU. So I'm ready and I'm mind we should be thinking about these types of memory here. And now it says a computer has two different types of memory, something memory, is not directly accessed by the CPU, but it allows the user to store data that can be easily accessed by applications. The stored program concept was that we need to have secondary memory location to store our files and our softwares. So we have RAM, which is storing the processes currently happening. We have ROM, which is storing our BIOS, our boot up instructions. They're our main memory, our primary memory, but we need a secondary memory to store data. And so this first one here will be our secondary memory. There are two main types of secondary memory. So the two examples of this type of memory are going to be HDD and SSD. 
So they are the two different types of memory that will be internal. So you'll have a hard drive inside of your computer. It will be a HDD or an SSD, probably an SSD these days. The second type of memory, well, that one's going to be our primary memory, but we can read the next sentence to make sure we feel comfortable with that. This memory is directly accessed by the CPU. Yep, primary memory is directly accessed by the CPU. It allows the processor to access data and instructions that are stored in memory. The two examples of this memory are RAM and ROM, or ROM and RAM. If you are not familiar with these, I'll also put a link to my memory and storage video for primary, secondary, and offline. This is a really important concept. You definitely want to know it for the exam. Input and output in real life scenarios. So we need to know the principles of operation of devices, but we also need to know where they're used and why. This is a really important scenario question. You need to read this carefully. So a supermarket has a system that allows customers to check their own shopping. This is a self-service checkout that is important. People may quickly make a mistake here. Listing an input device like a microphone, which would only be used by a cashier and not by a customer checking out their own shopping, so be careful. Um, now it says to identify and describe the purpose of two input devices and one output device. Let's start off by looking at a supermarket checkout, shall we? So here is a self-service checkout. Just take a look at all of the different devices that are attached to this, there's a lot. Um, we've got our barcode scanner here, this section is actually a scale. You can see that it's got this outer rim here. This is actually a weighing scale. We've got a card machine over here with a pin pad attached to it. So it's a credit card reader. It may also do contactless. We have a section for taking notes and taking coins. So you can pay with cash and you can pay with coins. And we also have this bit here is also a scale that makes sure that you're not putting extra items into the cart. We then also, of course, have the touch screen here um, for inputting. Now touchscreen is both an input and an output device so we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So we've got a load of devices here. Let's look at how we would write those for an exam. Uh, first of all a keypad. So we noticed we had a touchscreen on that one. You may not have um, touchscreen capabilities and you may just have an individual keypad for entering um, but this is less common now but this would be for something if you just need to enter in like the quantity of an item that you're buying. The weighing scales that we saw so that lets you weigh items for pricing so if I bought a bag of onions I pop them on the scale make a selection to say these are onions and it will weigh them and give me the price per pound the barcode scanner and reader so this is a really essential part so the customer can scan the items for their shopping um, and get the product details we have a card reader or a cash deposit so we have the coins we had the notes and we had a card reader so these are all different methods that the customer can make a payment and notice how I keep repeating here the customer can do this the customer can do this the customer can do this this is a self-service checkout for the customers this is me relating it back to the scenario so the touch screen now this is really common now but you may want to avoid putting the touch screen in the input device section and saving it for the output device section because you can only use touchscreen in one of them. You can't be duplicating this touchscreen. Um, so if you're not sure on the outputs and you need to like just keep a hold of this one, save it in your bank. This can be input and output. Um, but this is used for selecting information. So uh, payment method, do you want to have a bag? Uh, searching for items. So every time I go to the bakery, I need to search for my pan au chocolat. Um, and uh, enter in how many of those I'm buying, which is obviously just one. Um, so let's go back to our checkout. And now we're going to take a look for some output devices. So um, of course we have the touch screen, which is also the output device. So you can see it's giving me a display right here. It's giving me options immediately to make selections. You can also see over here, this, this is a printer. So that's going to give us our customer receipt. And then also up here is probably a speaker. There'll be somewhere a speaker as well. So what do those things get used for. So the touch screen, well that's going to display products for selection. It's giving us a visual confirmation. So if I scan something, it's going to show me a tally of what I've scanned so far. It'll keep a running total of my cost. There will also be a speaker. So if you've ever been at the checkout and you're scanning your own things, every time you scan something, it'll go boop, 
That means you scanned it correctly. But you will also get ones like meh, meh, meh. This is like an error sound. And that will let you know that it did not scan correctly. And lastly, this is a really easy one actually. Great one to remember. A printer. Because you need a receipt. So you may get a printing of your credit card receipt. You may get a printing of your itemised bill. And you could add that in actually. It provides an itemised bill. And if this question was about the advantages to a customer, then um, having an itemised bill printed would be a great advantage. Okay, so the operating system. There are so many answers to this question. Um, take a look in your textbook and you'll see a list of, you know, like 15 different functions. There are so many functions on an operating system. I'm just going to go, go through a couple of them and um, please go away and research some of these which ever seem the easiest for you to remember. But here are some key things that your operating system might do. Managing errors and interrupts. So if something goes wrong um, and the computer needs to act, an interrupt will be sent and it may prioritise to deal with that interrupt straight away. Uh, it's going to provide our graphical user interface. So this is how the user is able to give instructions to the computer. It allocates uh, memory for your processing and software requirements. We know this from the fetch execute when we think about the way that memory is handled and if we overflow into virtual memory. It manages our user accounts and profiles and all the settings that go with those. It manages security um, so perhaps it has to complete regular patches and updates to make sure the the operating system's up to date and you're not vulnerable and um, also manages all of the peripheral de devices like printers keyboards and for example if the printer had an error that then sends an interrupt or back to here where it's prioritizing dealing with that interrupt. So many features. Go away and learn. Probably three is enough for any exam. If you know three of them, you should be good. Process control and monitoring. This is one section that often trips people up and so pay attention to this section. The first part is just recognizing the sensors. Now, there is actually a huge amount of sensors, so I'm just gonna put them all out for you here. So bear in mind, this is two sensors, um, sensors that could be used in a chemical factory. So this I've taken directly from the mark scheme, and so you can just take a look the name of the sensor, and then an example of how it would be used in this situation. It's a really great idea to learn some of the different process controls that are likely to occur. So a chemical factory, a greenhouse. Um, look through the examples and learn three or four different sensors that you feel quite comfortable to explain within these different environments. And so what we're looking for is to give a sensor and then explain what it is doing. Um, so, you know, if you just relate it back to the chemicals um, and, you know, even if you're like, oh, I don't know what a chemical factory does, I'm terrible at science. Well, look at this one with the motion sensor. There are places that you're not supposed to be. So for a burglar alarm system and a chemical factory, you can use the motion infrared. So, you know, just um, take a, a minute and, you know, if you have to, take a guess and just throw down any sensor that you do know, okay? Now, the real tricky part of this question is the next section. So this is when we talk about how sensors are used in process control. These questions can vary from like four, four to eight marks, but if, I mean five to six is pretty standard. There is a formula to process control or monitoring. So mo monitoring is really no actions. Control is when actions occur, although this one is noted as monitoring, but you can mention action from the microprocessor. So follow and you will get the marks to this question, okay? So, first of all, you're gonna start out by whatever sensor you named, and bear in mind, this will work for any process control question, not just this scenario, any scenario, this is true. The named sensors, whichever one you named, continuously send data to the microprocessor. The sensors do not analyze this data at all. They do not know when the reading is too high, all they do is take a reading and send it. The microprocessor is absolutely our boss here. Before the microprocessor can deal with these, we're using analog sensors. So analog data, it's in waves. We need to get that converted into digital binary data. So these analog signals will be converted to digital data using an ADC. So that's an analog to digital converter. You can also throw this mark in later and switch it around with a DA which is a digital to analog converter. But definitely, again, no matter the scenario, this will get you a mark. 
next. So the microprocessor, our boss of the situation, will now compare the sense of readings against the preset values. Something has been programmed, the limits have been set, and the microprocessor will now compare that, okay? So if the value is out of range, so if temperature is greater than 23 degrees, something like that. So if the temperature is above that preset value, then the microprocessor will send a signal to sound an alarm or cause an action. So it could be that it just alarms for somebody to make that action, or it could be that it does something like open up a vent that reduces the temperature. Bear in mind I repeatedly mentioned the microprocessor. The microprocessor compares the value. The microprocessor sends a signal. The sensors do not do this. Most common mistake is all the the sensor um, realizes or compares the value, uh, the sensor sees that it's above the set value and then sends an alarm. No, the microprocessor does it all. It's the boss. If the readings are within range, so if the value is out of range, there's one action, but equally, if the readings are within range, then no direct action is taken. So we got ourselves a little, a little if else there. So then those outgoing readings and actions will be recorded or output as reports. So of course we're collecting the data as we go, we're monitoring, it's a monitor process. Um, it may also output regular reports with that data. And then essentially this process will be repeated again and again. It is a continuously repeating process. These are key answers. It doesn't matter what process you are talking about, as long as you put the right sensor name here and you mention that sensor with a little bit of detail here and what the action might be or the alarm might sound, all of these other ones are the same. Sensors send data to microprocessor. It's converted through an ADC. Microprocessor compares the values to preset. If it's over, if something, something happens, if not, nothing happens. Record those readings repeat the process. Learn these steps, apply them to different scenarios, you will get the marks for these questions. Gurdip wants to send a large file to Jennifer over the internet. State two benefits of compressing the file to send it. The most important part to this question is to look at the scenario of over the internet. Okay, so it's really important that we reference back to the internet specifically and what is involved with file size when we send online. So two benefits. Well, first of all, the file size will be smaller. It's just a smaller file size for transmission. That file will therefore or require less bandwidth to send. So if you were structure this into one nice sentence, you're going to pick up plenty of marks here. So the file size will be smaller for trans transmission. This will mean that it requires less bandwidth to send, and then the file will transfer faster. So those are our three items. So compressing the file will make it a smaller file for transmission. This will require less bandwidth to send, and therefore will send faster. Boom types of compression. We have a lossy and we have a lossless. We're going to choose the most suitable type of compression for the following and explain your choice. So downloading the code for a computer program. What type of compression will that be? So let's think about it. A computer program needs to be exact. You can't go deleting codes. You're missing one semicolon, it's going to cause you problems. So we do not want to lose any data here. It must be a lossless compression. And so we'd explain it just like that. The code for the computer program cannot be altered or changed. Therefore, we need a method where data cannot be lost. And then just knock in a little definition of what lossless is. So we've got one mark for identifying lossless, one for identifying it in the scenario, you can't change a computer program, you can't lose any data, and then one mark for explaining, well, a lossless compression allows the file to be restored exactly with no loss. On to our next one, video streaming. Well, we've had lossy, you could probably take a Pretty good guess that this is going to be the lossless one, but let's explain why. So with a video file, there is a ton of data on there, like certain sounds, maybe um, a, a bit at the beginning, which isn't necessary, some blank space. A video file can contain data that can be removed and it will not cause a noticeable difference to the viewer. So they will never notice that this unnecessary data is gone, but they will notice when it doesn't stream very very quickly. So this smaller file size allows it to stream faster without noticing a huge amount of difference in quality. 
Okay, so this diagram shows five operating system functions and five descriptions. Let's see how we did. We just had a question about this. So how are we going to do with this one? So um, approaches to this, um, perhaps just go through and find the ones that you feel confident that you do know. So, I mean, we mentioned interrupt earlier. Um, so that was a signal which causes the operating system to take a specified action. Uh, next we have utility. So utility program is a set task to be performed. Uh, memory management, um, assigning memory to the computer. And in fact, if you wanted to have those kind of, earlier I mentioned, learn like three different ones, why don't you just learn the definition of one of these ones? And then if you get an operating question, you've learned a couple of these and they're great definitions. So spooling, okay, so that's when we temporarily hold the data in the buffer. And then multitasking, well, it's uh, the appearance of running many things simultaneously. Of course, instructions happen in order, but very, very quickly, and uh, it appears simultaneous for the user's needs. So a high definition video and a large text file are to be sent as email attachments. Both files are compressed before sending. Each file is compressed using a different type of compression algorithm. Explain with reasons the type of data compression algorithm you would choose for each file. So we've got a high definition video and we've got a text file. We're back again, same section. This time it's not a code document, but it's a text file and you can't be losing words within the text. You need to have the full text, okay? So straight away we can say this is going to be our lossy, our lossless. We can know the video is going to be lossy and the text file will be a lossless compression because we can't lose data from your text file. You'd be pretty upset if you wrote an essay and then compressed it and sent it and it had taken out half of your words. That's no good. So you can use RLE or run length encoding and um, what that will do is it will code based on repetitions, repeat Repeating sequences of characters will then be coded and allow it to be recreated. That's specifically why they mention a large text file because you need a larger file for the coding to be worthwhile. Um, and then our HD video, as mentioned already, will be a lossy compression because there will be data that we can lose that will not affect the overall quality of the file for the viewer. So it's just going to remove unnoticeable details and sound. So we should be pretty confident with those two now. So sound and video files, lossy, text documents, program files, lossless. Okay, so a register in a computer contains binary digits. Come on, binary! The contents of the register could represent a binary integer. Convert the binary integer to deanery and to decimal. Let's start with the deanery. Here are our positions for the first eight binary digits. Quite simply, we're gonna add up any true bits, 32, 16, four, two, and one, it's 55. So a deanery value of 55. For hexadecimal, remember binary to hexadecimal is really easy. Don't even try to convert this 55 to hexadecimal or anything like that. Save yourself the trouble and divide it into nibbles. So you put it into two nibbles and work out the small numbers that are associated. So for our first one, we've got two and one, which makes three, and then four, two, and one, which makes seven. So three and seven, the hexadecimal is three, seven. So now it mentions the contents of the register could represent the ASCII value for a single deanery digit seven. So if we, we look at this, um, and actually we can keep this divide here a second because it kind of helps us. This is part of the ASCII code. This is the binary for seven. So it says write down the ASCII value for nine. You might be like, how am I supposed to know the ASCII value for nine? Um, I did not memorize that table. You don't need to. You're simply just gonna change this section to be nine. Or if you have like a larger number and it's, you know, just two more in sequence, just add two onto the binary number that already exists and do whatever digit changes you need to to just add two to that number. For this one, so all I've done is make this into a nine. I've kept this bit the same, that's the ASCII part, and I've just made this eight plus one. Eight plus one makes nine, and that's the ASCII value. What's that as a deanery? Well, um, you can add them up individually if you want to, but you could also just add two 
onto this. <laughs> that would also give you the correct answer because it's just two larger. A hexadecimal, you could do the exact same and just add on two again. So you could just add two to the seven and it would be three nine instead of three seven. But equally, you can work it out by saying, okay, that's three and this will be eight plus one and will be nine. This is a little bit of a more complicated question. It says, write in register X the binary number you would use with AND gates to convert the ASCII value of 7 to its binary integer value. So basically, we covered that these were like the ASCII representation, um, and this was the 7. So if we wanted this to just be the binary integer value of 7, we only want these. We don't want this because the binary value of this number, as we learned before, was 55. So we just want to get rid of those and only have the 7. So um, how do AND gate works? An AND gate produces a true output from here, so a true output when both inputs are one, okay? So if both inputs are not one, then we will not get a true output. So basically what we wanna do is make this register have the values that will produce either a true or false. So we wanna make all of these come out false and all of these come out true. So your first ones, if you want it to be true, there needs to be another one because both of these would have to contain a one. And for these ones, if you want it to be false, then you need to throw in some zeros. You definitely need zeros. Let's put them in here, but you definitely need zeros for these two. You could arguably put a one here, here and here, and you still wouldn't get. But look, zero plus zero, zero. Zero plus zero, zero. One and zero, so one, zero, zero. One, zero, zero. You're getting it. But these ones will produce a true. And so the resulting bit from this would produce one, one, one. Okay, so let's look at these barcodes. So this describe the differences between a barcode and a QR code. So I've put in examples of them here. So this is a barcode code. This one is a QR code. So um, the first thing that you might notice is these three, these lines here. So this is vertical lines and these are squares. Um, so this is basically a 1D. This is one dimensional. So it only has the data going across. It's one dimension, but a QR code goes down and across. So that is two dimensional. So that can be your first difference. It's one dimensional versus two dimensional. And that is represented differently as well. So here we're using squares for a QR code, whereas the barcode is just using vertical lines. Simple explanations will get you marks here. Now a QR code is much easier to read this from any angle. The barcode, you really have to get it lined up. You can do it from above or you can do it from below, but it needs to be lined up horizontally. Whereas a QR code, if you've ever done one with your phone, is really easy to just kind of click onto from any angle. So the QR code can also hold a huge amount more data. Barcode is only around a maximum of 25 characters as opposed to the 7,000 characters you would get with a QR code. What about functions? So these are some clear differences in their properties. This is a difference in how and where they're used. So think about barcodes. We see them on products that we buy in the supermarket. Um, your school might have barcoded some of their equipment. You will see them on the back of books. Um, they have a very specific function and location. So you know, supermarkets, libraries. But a QR code is so commonly used by people. You have probably made one yourself. You could go online right now and make yourself a QR code and that could link to to all sorts of different media types and can be accessed on a number of media types as well. And so you see them in everyday life for advertising and giving information and links and they are read by a device that everybody has, a phone or a tablet. You don't need a specialist device of a barcode reader to read them. All right, so let's recap back on that hexadecimal, okay? So three uses of hexadecimal um, and give an example that matches its use. So actually what I've done is I've just put the mark scheme straight in for you here so that you can see what it is that they're looking for. So when they say they want you to give an example that matches the use, they want to see you represent it. So we can mention our HTML color codes are used in web development. Well, can you show me what that looks like? Actually, yes, I can. And so here is an example of blue because there's no red, no green, and it's all blue. Um, and so the same thing here. So showing some machine code, displaying a MAC address, which has to have the six different blocks of two. 
um, displaying ASCII or Unicode and then the error codes like we mentioned before with something like a washing machine for example. So just make sure you also know kind of what they look like. So why would we use hexadecimal to represent binary numbers? So specifically why would we use it to represent binary numbers? So we're making a real comparison here between the number of characters that are used to represent the same type of data um, and why that's useful. So first of all, it's really much easier for programmers to read and understand. If you read on a page that's just thousands of ones and zeros, that's very difficult to understand. Compare that to this. If you were finding errors, it's a lot easier to identify errors that look like this than it will all ones and zeros. So also, if you needed to convert between them, so we've done conversion earlier today and it was so easy. Also, it allows you to display more on the screen or you can display more on smaller screens. So as we mentioned, um, sort of embedded systems, a washing machine, things where you might have a code to quickly represent. So I had one um, in Japan that used to get really linty really quickly. And um, that would always be the first error that would show up. It was like C24 and it meant that I needed to clean my lint tray. Um, it's also much faster for data entry, much easier um, for you to enter um, and make less mistakes. So if you're reading it um, from another screen or from a paper, you're going to be able to put 73964 a lot easier than like 001, 0001. Oh, how many zeros did I do now? It's hard. It's too hard. Memory and storage. We just talked about these a little bit before. We talked about primary, talked about secondary. We're going to bump in a little bit to offline now as well. So primary is right there on the CPU. Secondary is internal. Offline is external. So primary storage is an internal memory. We call it main memory. It is directly accessed by the CPU. And as we mentioned earlier, is RAM and ROM. Secondary storage is internal but not directly accessed by the CPU, um, will give us a non-volatile storage. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we can store data, turn the computer off, and that will not be lost. Examples of this, a HDD and an SSD. Offline storage. So this is external to the computer. This is any portable medium that you can take away from the computer and travel to a different location with. Also non-volatile, you will not lose your data when you unplug it from the machine. And this is any external device as an example. HDDs and SSDs, just make sure you say external. Any type of optical disk, flash memory. Small note, always say flash memory stick. Do not not call that a USB because USB is a universal serial bus. Do not call your memory stick a USB. Our last question for today. So a set of photographs has been taken for a wedding. All the guests are to be sent digitally stored copies through the ordinary postal service. There are 50 photographs and each photograph is between 1.8 to 2.5 megabytes in size. Work out the storage, the maximum storage space required for a set of photographs and state with a reason a suitable medium to use for the copies to be sent to guests. So we're going maximum storage size. So we need to look at our upper limits here. So we have 50 photographs with a max size of 2.5 megabytes. So we are simply going to do 2.5 megabytes times by 50, and that will give us 125 megabytes. Now the next section is where people will most likely go wrong because you need to look and see this is the ordinary postal service. That means we are not sending these electronically. They are being sent through the post. So it has to be a physical medium. You cannot talk about cloud storage or sending it digitally. So what would be the medium for sending this? Well you need something small and not too expensive so I would choose a CD or any sort of low capacity SD card or a flash memory stick. So these are all quite small things. A CD is flat and small and it's easy to post. SD card, memory stick also quite small, flat and lightweight. Reasons for that? Well, they're small and that makes them easier and cheaper to post because a lot of the time when you post, you post by weight. So if it's a heavy device, then it's more to post. And then also they are quite cheap and inexpensive to buy. So you can buy like a big collection of memory sticks with 
with a low capacity in bulk quite easily or a stack of CDs, no problem. That's the final exam question. That is our questions for today. I hope that these paper one questions were really useful to you. If you enjoyed them, um, I'll also be making a paper two video very soon. So do like, subscribe and come back and watch more videos. And I hope that you do really, really well in your examinations this year. Thank you.